Um, so first of all, hello everybody and welcome to today's event. This is the midway point for us in My World Garden Week. So I really hope that you've been um, enjoying that over the, the last few few days. Um, we've been going live from our gardens. You might have seen Hilary this morning talking about her pond, which is all very lovely. And uh, I, was, I was filming live from my garden on Tuesday, which was very fun. And uh, tomorrow uh, we've got another My World City project officer called Russell, who will be talking all about how to go chemical free in the garden. But this event is called uh, Wildlife Gardening, uh, Gardening for Wildlife rather, and it should be really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, just to quickly touch on, um, myself and Hilary are from the My World City team based in Manchester. We're all about um, local wildlife, inspiring people about the nature living on their doorsteps and the importance of gardens for nature, which are of course important spaces for wildlife, not just in Manchester, but also throughout Greater Manchester and uh, beyond. So with that, I think I'll just hand over to Hilary to just go into some very quick Zoomy thing. Yes, okay, thanks very much, Ellie. Right, just, uh, I know everyone's really used to Zoom now. We're uh, more than a year in, aren't we? So um, just a very quick housekeeping points. Your cameras are off through the whole of this session, so you can't be seen. And your microphones are off as well, so we can't hear anything that's going on in your background. Uh, another thing is that the session's going to be recorded, uh, so it'll be made available online after the event, so you can catch up with it if you have to leave halfway through for any reason. Um, so yeah, I know people have been using the chat function, which is great to tell us where you're, you're dialing in from. Thanks very much for that. And we will have some time for questions uh, after the speakers. So uh, if you want to put those in the Q&A box, that'd be great because if you put them in the chat, sometimes we, we lose them in there. So if you use the Q&A box and um, hopefully we'll have time to answer your question at the end. Um, so I think uh, without further ado, I'll hand you over to our first speaker, Steve Garland, who's a very keen wildlife gardener, as you'll see from his uh, presentation. And he's also a keen entomologist, which you can probably see from his T-shirt. Um, after Steve's talking, we'll have Jenny joining us, who's a colleague here at the Wildlife Trust, and she's on our Mosslands team. So she works on the Mosslands team and is going to talk to you all about peat and peat-free compost. Okay, I'll hand over to you, Steve. Great, thanks. I shall just now share my screen. Um, it should be, hmm. there we are, success. Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to run through just a few things about wildlife gardening because I could talk for hours on it, but uh, I've got 15 minutes. Uh, just starting with what is a wildlife garden? And a lot of people think it's just a bit of land that you can't be bothered managing and can't be bothered looking after. That isn't what it is really to me. It's a place where it's a garden for you and it's a place for wildlife. And my garden is for me, I enjoy it. I grow food and vegetables in there and I encourage wildlife. So it's not just a bit of waste ground that nobody cares about. There are lots of different things to look at in wildlife gardening, but I've just picked out five that I would say are the most important. If you, if you do one or any one of these, it's a big step forward. If you do all of them, it's great. And I'll also say, you know, if you've got a huge garden, a small garden, or even a balcony, there are some of these things you can do. First one really is stop using pesticides. I'm gonna come back to all these in a bit more detail. Next is add a pond. Provide food for wildlife, provide a home for wildlife, and make a compost heap. So those are the things I'm going to go through. Now, the pesticides element is, is huge. If you go to any garden centre, this is the sort of thing you see at some point. Uh, there are things there uh, to kill all sorts of stuff. 
Um, there's a thing over here for killing wood lice. I don't know why you'd want to kill wood lice, but you can buy something to do it. You can kill wasps, you can kill slugs, you can kill plants. Um, I do grow my own vegetables. And some people say, well, you know, um, why, why do you grow your own vegetables? Is it to save money? One of the main reasons I do is because you get fresh vegetables that taste good. And I know they have no chemicals on them because I don't use this stuff. Having said that, if you look closely, slug gone there is in fact uh, a sort of processed wool. So that is actually a, a non-chemical control of slugs. So there are some alternatives coming on the market now. And I would say, have a close look at the packet before you tempted to buy something. Adding a pond. This is in my garden. All the pictures are taken in my garden. Well, apart from the, the pesticides there. And this is a sort of medium sized pond, but even a small uh, bucket with water in can be enough for a few frogs, frogs to breed. And you can see in the centre here, a whole load of frogs that turn up every spring. They've just done this in our garden a few weeks ago. Tadpoles on the right, which is what it looks like now. And you get the odd bird like the grey wagtail paying you a brief visit. Um, animals and birds drink there, they bathe there. And if you look in the water, it's full of invertebrates. Providing food. Now, probably the commonest thing people do for wildlife, I think, is feeding the birds. And you can even do this if you haven't got a garden at all. You can hang something outside your window. And uh, at the top, you've got the bird feeder. But at the bottom, you've got a goldfinch that's eating uh, seeds off our verbena and our teasels in the garden. And this is something I don't cut any of my plants down in the autumn. Everything lasts through the winter because there are things that will eat the seeds and there are insects that hide in the dead leaves and get protection from the frost. But the other sort of food you can provide is plants. This little pink flower here, I've got a lot of this growing in my garden. It's cuckoo flower. It's a wild flower that grows in wet places. Unfortunately, a lot of my garden's quite wet, so it grows really well. If you look very closely in the middle here, you can see a little, gr a little green and white thing. And that is the caterpillar of an orange tip moth, uh, orange tip butterfly. And they feed on the cuckoo flower. So by providing cuckoo flower, you get a pretty flower, but you also provide a food plant for the orange tip butterfly to live, if you're lucky. And the obvious thing as well is for pollinators, lots of flowers, lots of big, simple flowers that they can feed on. You know, Red Admiral on, on one of my sunflowers. Providing a home. I, there are a lot of different things that animals and insects need to survive. But on the left here is a bug hotel. It's my old bug hotel. It's actually looking like I need to get a new one soon. It's getting a bit uh, rotten, but it still has bees living in there. And on the right is your sort of bog standard bird box, which is another simple thing you can do, even if you have a tiny garden. And that one there is now about six years old and it has a, a, a brood of blue tits every single year. And the last thing I mentioned is making a compost heap. Um, it's good for the garden in that you, you're recycling stuff and it's putting goodness back into the soil. Uh, it's also a really good home for a lot of invertebrates. It'll be, if it's a healthy one, it'll be full of worms and wood lice and beetles. And these will do very well in the compost heap, but they'll also spread out and occupy the rest of your garden as well. And the plant growing just behind the compost heap here is a thing called comfrey, which is a wildflower. Fantastic for bees, absolutely amazing for bees. Um, but if you cut it down a couple of times in the year, it helps your compost break down faster. So it's a great plant to grow. Excellent for insects, excellent for compost. You can also see other things here, like I grow marigolds because they, they bring in more pollinating insects um, and they distract some of the pests off the crops. And th that brings me on to one thing. When I talk about no pesticides and I talk about all these sorts of other things, the first thing most people ask is how do you cope with the pests? And um, yeah, they are a challenge if you want to grow your own food particularly because they want to eat it as well. But they're not all as bad as you may think. This wonderful big beetle that if you're lucky you might get flying into your lights at night is called a cockchafer. So it's about three quarters of an inch long and it used to be very, very common, but it's now becoming extinct in many areas. It has a big fat grub that lives under the soil and feeds on the roots of plants. So because it nibbles away at roots of plants, it is seen as a pest. And yet, I mean, I think these are beautiful. And because they fly at night and because they're so big, 
they're one of the most important foods for some of our larger bats. And the decline of some of the large bats is almost certainly connected with the decline of these beetles. So I love seeing these in the garden and they're quite regular. Luckily, where I live up north of Lancaster, we do see them quite a lot. Aphids, oh, people hate these and they can't wait to spray them. But actually, with a few exceptions, they don't really damage the plants too much. We get a lot of the, this is, these are aphids on an elderberry bush in our garden and it just, I just leave it because it doesn't do the bush any harm. We get them on our uh, broad beans and I nip the buds off the broad beans to get rid of the aphids and uh, squash them. And that keeps them under control enough for me to get the beans off. Um, and the sparrows eat a lot of these things off the plants. I watch our house sparrows going around eating them. And if the sparrows aren't eating them, on the bottom left there is a hoverfly larva and the next thing to it is a ladybird larva, both of which rely on green fly to survive. So if you spray your green fly, you're also killing um, hoverflies, ladybirds, and you're depriving sparrows of food. So don't do it. Slugs, another bad one. The horrible metaldehyde slug pellets are really nasty to use in your garden. On the whole, slugs aren't too much of a problem. If you are just putting fresh plants out, there are some organic approved uh, pellets that you can put on. Uh, I think it's ferrous phosphate, much, much safer to use than, than the traditional ones. And there are things like that wool that I showed you at the beginning, which you can put around plants, which will deter slugs. If it's got an organic, approved for organic use on it, that's a lot better. Than anything else. If it's not approved for organic then it's probably quite nasty. Um, but there are only a few species of slugs that are a problem. I do have a problem with in my garden but only when you're freshly planting things. So, oops. The other things that people see as pests they don't like are ants. Um, I think with ants it's mainly that when people see all the uh, queens emerging in the hot weather in August they and they're flying around they worry about them. On the whole ants, provided they stay out from the inside of your house, um, I can live with them. There are a lot of ants in my garden. They turn over the soil very well um, and um, I don't really see them as a problem. These little black ones, which are the main ones you get in gardens, don't even have a sting. So they're not even nasty like that. And wasps. Now this is the what a lot of people say to me, what use are wasps? Well, they eat all sorts of things and particularly they love eating caterpillars. And last summer, I watched the wasps, I had a wasp nest in my garden and they used to go out and they used to pick all the caterpillars off my cabbages. And I've had very few caterpillars on my cabbages last year. In fact, there are my cabbages last year and uh, no chemicals sprayed on there. And the wasps, they didn't eat all the cap caterpillars, but they ate some. And this is another thing that I think is important to bear in mind if you just, if you're a gardener, is you're growing a lot of food, but surely you can spare a little bit of it for the insects and the birds. So I don't get paranoid about the odd caterpillar on my cabbages nibbling a few holes. Um, I just, um, if I get too many, I might go around and squash them, but I certainly would never spray them. I don't want to eat a cabbage with chemicals in it. Um, here's a eyed hawk moth caterpillar on my apple tree. I'm ex I love seeing those, they're very welcome. And even my apples, if a few birds want to have a nibble at one or two, I don't mind, I can cope with that. I've got plenty to eat. And I think the, the other thing about doing wildlife gardening is when you start, it takes a while for the wildlife to kind of discover things. Um, you can put a bird box up. You might not get birds in it first year. Bat boxes are even worse. They take a lot longer. My first year in this house, I built a hedgehog box. I was, I've always wanted hedgehogs in the garden. So I built a hedgehog box. And for seven years, I kept watching this box and were no hedgehogs. But in year eight, I put my, I thought there was something around, put my trail cam out and in the pouring rain one evening, this is what I got. So it, it may take some time, but don't give up. Eventually you might be lucky. That was eight years of waiting before I got my first hedgehogs. Now they come around every year, which is great. So that's a success, but be patient. I just want to finish off. This is a picture of our garden when we moved into this house. And if you go around the countryside, around the towns, this is what a lot of people's gardens look like. A mown lawn, some concrete, that's it. And after a number of years, 
working for wildlife, working for growing food and other things, it slowly has been transformed into this. Now, which one would you prefer? I know which one the wildlife prefer and I know which one I prefer. That's uh, me finished, thanks. And I'll now pass you on to Jenny, who is going to talk to us about another aspect of gardening for wildlife. I'll just take my screen off now. There we are. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Steve. Your garden is an absolute triumph. You must be delighted by it. I know I certainly would be if I could ever make anything look quite that good. But there's a load of really useful tips, so thank you. Um, yeah, so as Steve said, um, my name's Jenny. I am the communications officer for our peatlands team um, here at the Wildlife Trust for Lancashire, Manchester and North Merseyside. Um, we have a number of peatland reserves across our region um, and I'm really lucky, well, I count myself really lucky that I get to work with them and get to go and visit them. Um, so there was one thing I wanted to talk to you today um, about another thing that you can really do to help support wildlife in your garden and that's going peat free. So I'm just going to share my screen which should hopefully work. Um, hopefully we can all see that. There we go. Right so yeah I'm here today to talk to you about going peat free. So what we can see in the background of this picture here is Little Walden Moss, which is one of our peatland nature reserves. It's just uh, kind of on the border of Salford and Warrington. Now Little Walden Moss is a lowland raised peat bog, which is actually a really rare habitat. Um, our region has lost 98% of our lowland raised peat bogs. So the few that are remaining are just so incredibly precious. And I think you'll probably agree that looking at this picture, they're really beautiful. The white plant that you can see in the background here is cotton grass, which um, it's actually it's seed heads and they kind of flower and it officially flowers um, around sort of April and May time. They're just beginning to come out now and they sprinkle the whole site with what looks like a little dusting of snow. And these are absolutely beautiful. It's, it's a really wonderful place. If you ever get the chance to visit, I'd highly recommend it. There's a lovely footpath that runs around the site. Um, but Little Walden Moss did not always look like this. It used to look like this because Little Walden Moss was, a, was subject to commercial extraction of the peat for use in horticulture. So, um, all of the vegetation was stripped off, huge big drainage ditches that you can see here were dug to drain all the water out of the bog. Um, and then massive diggers came in and literally dug the peat out of the ground, nearly decimating the entire site. And you might be thinking, well, why? Why would anyone want to do that to these wonderful areas? and it is to fill bags of compost. When you go to the garden centre and you walk down and you look at all the different bags of compost, many of them will contain peat and that peat has been dug out of peatlands right throughout the world. It's not just your bags of compost, it's also used to grow on a lot of the plants that you buy. So you might be completely inspired by Steve's lovely talk then, I mean I know I am, and want to go out and create a beautiful garden for wildlife and buy beautiful plants that are amazing for your pollinators. Um, but if they have been grown in peat then they are basically, to create that habitat in your garden, you're destroying another one. But why should we care? What's so special about but uh, actually, I think there's loads of really special things about peatlands. They're basically a bit of a superhero habitat. So they have a whole suite of ecosystem service benefits that they provide when they are in a lovely, healthy, wet, boggy, squelchy condition. 
they're amazing for biodiversity, they're exceptional carbon stores, they help us naturally mitigate floods, they decrease our risk of wildfires, and they even naturally filter our drinking water. They are really, really amazing. So just to kind of really hammer that point home a little bit more, I thought I'd just go through, tell you a bit more about each of these, these amazing benefits that we get from healthy peatlands. So biodiversity, peatlands are amazing habitats. They support a range of really fantastic uh, animal life. We can see up here, we've got, you find brown hares, we've got uh, lots of different invertebrates, as a small copper butterfly there. We get amphibians as common toad. We've got lizards, common lizard we find. Uh, dragonflies, this beautiful picture of emperor dragonfly there. Uh, birds such as curlews, snipe um, are all found on them. And um, lovely, this one down in the bottom corner is the bogbush cricket, which is an amazing name. Um, and that's completely um, specialised to peatlands. You only find them there. It's not just plants, uh, sorry, not just animals, it's plants too. Um, and some of the plants are amazing. So one of the most important plants that you'll find on a peatland is sphagnum moss. Now this we can see down in the bottom left corner. I'm terrible at my left and right, sorry. Um, and sphagnum moss is actually the building block of peat. It's, a, it's peat's keystone species. So as sphagnum moss grows it um, kind of the top layers grow and as it does that the bottom layers really slowly decompose. Peatlands are really wet and they're really acidic and these conditions mean that decomposition is incredibly incredibly slow but the decomposition of the sphagnum moss and the other plants is actually what forms the peat really slowly like one millimeter a year peat forms. Um, so yeah, you need you need mosses, you need sphagnum moss on your peatlands, but we also get other beautiful things. So we've got um, flowering plants, and we can see cross-leaved heath just above the moss there, with these gorgeous little pink flowers, which are a lovely source of nectar for a lot of our pollinators. Um, we have bog uh, rosemary in the centre with its little kind of jewelly dropping down flowers. We've got bog cranberry next to it, which um, you can actually eat those, they're delicious. Um, but peatlands are also home to some really cool carnivorous plants. So we actually do have native carnivorous plants in the UK and a lot of them have evolved to live on peatlands. So the one we can see in the center with the red leaves is called sundew. And these are awesome, these are really cool little things. So you can see their leaves and at the end of their leaves they've got these little tentacles with little drops of what looks like dew on the end which is where they get their name from but this dew is actually really sticky so as a little insect is flying across it'll get stuck onto the dew and then the leaf will slowly kind of close up around it and the insect will be digested it's marvelously gruesome but really fascinating and that beautiful and then down in the uh, bottom right hand corner what may not look like the most inspiring thing with the least exciting name ever is lesser bladderwort. Now this is an aquatic carnivorous plant that you find in the bog pools on peatlands and it is actually the fastest creature on earth. So it has these little bladders, sort of little suction tubes, little chambers and this has a vacuum action. So as a little aquatic insect might be flying past, uh, swimming past, sorry, the bladder will be able to react to that insect in one ten thousandth of a second and suck it into the, the bladder where it then gets digested, which is really gross, but really cool, it certainly is if you ask me there's actually a youtube video of it that even when it's super slowed down you still can't really see it um so yeah they're amazing you know we're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis and peatlands are a really important part of that for hosting such a really exciting range of wildlife but it's not just biodiversity they are incredibly important natural resources in the fight against climate change a healthy peatland, when it is wet and boggy and happy and great, absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. It literally sucks it 
out of the air and stores it within the peat for millennia. And you can see there globally, peatlands store twice as much carbon as forests, yet they only actually cover between three and 5% of the Earth's surface. So, you know, if we can look after our peatlands, they can genuinely help in the fight against climate change. However, as soon as a peatland is damaged or degraded in any way, such as being drained and dug up for use in horticulture, all that carbon gets released back up into the atmosphere, actually contributing to climate change. And as you can see, you know, currently emissions from degraded peatlands account for 5% of our total UK greenhouse gas releases, which is a huge amount. And we need to help protect our peatlands to help, you know, in our, in our fight against climate change. But it's not only that. Um, they're also, peatlands can also help us um, tackle flooding. So when they're healthy, peatlands basically act like great big sponges and they can soak up rainfall and they release it then really slowly downstream, which helps to mitigate flood events. However, if they are degraded and they're dry in any way, the water just literally runs straight off the top, straight into our water courses that can really help exacerbate flooding. You can see that um, our sphagnum mosses, our, our keystone species within peat, can hold up to 20 times their weight in water. You can literally kind of pick it up and squeeze it out and huge amounts of water comes out of it. So they're really important for natural flood mitigation too. They also, help us to decrease wildfire risks. I think, you know, we can all remember there seems to be huge wildfires um, in the UK and across the world kind of all the time. Um, but a lot of these, certainly in the UK, are on upland peatlands, but wet peat doesn't burn, quite simply. So if we can help to, to protect our peatlands, then we can really help to decrease our risk of wildfires and all the horrible things that come with that. Not just our releases of carbon into the air, which you can see, you know, those peak district wildfires released huge amounts of carbon, but also you think about the effect on biodiversity and all the animals and plants that are living there as well. But then it's not only that, peatlands also help to naturally filter our drinking water. So it's estimated that around 70% of drinking water in the UK comes from upland catchlands that are peatland dominated. And when they are lovely and healthy, peatlands naturally filter that drinking water, leaving it clear and lovely. But when they are degraded, the carbon within those peatlands actually it, it dissolves and it leaches from the peatlands into our watercourses. So I don't know if you've ever been for a walk and you've seen a river or a stream or a beck that's kind of got that colour of like strong tea. Um, that is carbon that has been washed out of peatlands. Um, and once that gets into our watercourses, that's actually very difficult for the water companies to remove. Um, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's energy heavy, whereas actually a healthy peatland will do all that for us. So, you know, that's a kind of really quick whistle stop tour on why peatlands are really amazing um, and why I think we really need to protect them. However, in the UK, every year it's estimated that we use around 3 million cubic metres of peat for the horticultural industry alone. So this is the peat that is dug out of the ground. This is another picture of little Walden moss while it was during peat extraction. Um, and the, that peat is dug out of the ground. It is put into those bags of compost that you buy and it is used to, burn, to grow the plants that you're buying from your garden centres but we have the power to change that. 70% of the peat that is used in the horticultural industry in the UK goes to the domestic market. So if you think that if everyone in that domestic market simply stopped buying peat, what a huge reduction that would be. We can really make a difference and the power is there. And there are peat-free alternatives there's peat-free alternatives to peat-based composts and you can go and you can buy them and you can use them. And so that is why I'm asking everybody to consider going peat-free in your gardens. 
um, because you can genuinely make a big difference to um, our climate, our biodiversity, and our really amazing peatland habitats right across the world just by doing that. So um, I just wanted to finish up with just a few little tips about, you know, some of the ways that it can make, you can make your life a bit easier going peat free. So the first thing to do is when you are buying compost, check the label. So basically, if a bag of compost is peat free, it will have peat free written all over it in great big letters. But for some, they kind of hide their peat. So you need to like flip that bag over, read the list of ingredients, some will tell you how much peat is in by like, oh, there's only 40% peat, that's fine. All right? Well, no, it's not because 40% of what is in that bag has been dug out of the peat. So you do need to read the labels and to check it. There is also, um, you may come across a compost that says it contains responsibly sourced peat or peat that has not been dug out of areas that are you know ecologically sensitive there is no such thing there is no such thing as responsibly sourced peat if there is peat in a bag of compost a peatland has been destroyed to create that but the peat free alternatives are there a lot of them are really good. So when peat free alternatives first came onto the market years and years ago, there was some kind of concern about, oh, it's not very good, blah, blah, blah. But there's actually a lot of the brands of peat free compost now are being shown to outperform peat based composts in consumer trials. Um, and yeah, just look at those labels. If it does not say peat free, 100% peat free on it, then it has peat in that bag. And please consider not buying it. Um, my other top tip is to embrace online. This is especially useful when you are looking to buy plants that have been grown in peat free. So this would sometimes be slightly more difficult to find in your garden centres. Um, quite often, a lot of plants will have been grown in at least a proportion of peat, but there is a growing number of independent peat-free nursery is uh, popping up around the UK and nearly all of them will offer online ordering and delivery. I have to admit I have got completely into online plan shopping, it is just great. You just sit there, go through like, oh that looks nice, I'll have one of those, that looks nice, I'll have one of those, go through and then a couple of days later a beautiful delivery turns up and normally you know packaged plastic free and things as well um, and you have wonderful 100% peat free plants. Um, there are, are um, local, you can sometimes find local garden centres and nurseries that do um, provide peat free plants. Things like B&Q, their own brand bedding plants are peat free but they don't really shout about it which is annoying to be honest um, <laughs> but if you are going to the nursery you're going to the garden center you're going plant shopping ask that is one of the most important things you can do ask the staff say where are your peat free options please where is your peat free compost where are your peat free plants and if they don't have any just say i'm going to take my business elsewhere please um the more and more that we can get the, the message out there that people want peat free, then the more the market is going to respond to that. Um, so yeah, so that's me. I will um, stop sharing my screen and come back. Um, and yeah, so basically I'm just really trying to kind of plead, plead for everyone to go peat free, because um, it is a really wonderful thing that you can do from the environment, from the comfort of your own back garden. Thanks very much, Jenny. Thanks very much, Steve. That's great. Thank you. And uh, I certainly, as I said at the start, we're all thinking about gardening at the moment, aren't we? And people will be going out to buy bags of compost. So you've got some really good advice there. Thank you.
So we've had some questions in the chat and the Q&A. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Steve and Jenny if they can answer some of them. If we don't have time to ask your question, then um, we can always get back to you with an answer later on. So don't don't panic if uh, if you really need to know an answer and um, we haven't got around to your question. So um, I think, Steve, I'd like to ask you, Kenny's question is about sowing seeds for flowers for bees and butterflies. And what what are the best sort of best sort of species? What are the best sort of flowers to grow for bees and butterflies, do you think? Well, I see from Kenny's question, he's, he's also saying a shaded area that he wants to mm. plant. That is a little bit more of a challenge because a lot of the wildflower mixes you buy are sort of meadow, which do very well in the sunshine. So it, I would say it depends just how shaded it is. If it's very shaded, you're going to be looking at, th at a woodland wildflower seed, really. Um, and woodland wildflowers tend to be at the best in the spring because as the leaves come on the trees, then they, they, you get the leaves, but uh, you don't get quite so many flowers. But of course the leaves could still be food for insects. So um, but I think that's probably the most important. I mean, the more, the more flowers you get, the better, basically. Um, but it's, you do need to think about, you know, how much light they're gonna get. Yeah, I guess, um... I mean, when you think of the, the woodlands now are at their best, aren't they, really, or just coming into their best, you know, we've, we've had the, the snowdrops and the celandine and, and, you know, the bluebells are soon coming out and it's, it's all those sort of plants, isn't it? That well, celandine and wood and emery are great. Uh, celandine, you've got, to, you know, it can kind of take over a bit. Um, so you have to think, you know, think about that before you uh, introduce that but wood and emery won't and um, yeah I mean our native woodland species are the ones I, I would think of going for there yeah brilliant thanks Steve then we've got um a couple of pond questions from Jane and Simon so Jane's worried about algae and whether she should take it out of her pond and then Simon is planning a pond and wants to know about advice about the depth of a plot a a pond, a new pond, how deep should it be or how shallow should it be? Don't know if you've got some, any thoughts on that, Steve? Well, yes. Um, I mean, I'll take the algae one first. Um, if you have a pond at some point, you'll probably find you get a lot of algae in it. And the algae that you're talking about is the, the slimy stuff in big, long strings, uh, which can really choke up a pond. And what that is, is a sign of a lot of nutrients in the water. So quite often you get that when you've got a new pond because you've got lots of fresh plants in there, fresh soil, stuff like that. And it means there's a lot of nutrients in the water which helps the algae grow. And I do take it out, I get a stick and wind it round and take it out and put it on the compost heap uh, if it gets really bad. But as my pond has got older and older and I've got more plants growing in it and more, I mean, it's absolutely crawling with all sorts of invertebrates. And um, I don't get algae outbreaks at all now and uh, the water stays clear well I tell a lie the one time I might get them is if I decide I need to take a plant out or move it what happens is you stir up all the soil and all the nutrients go into the water and make it cloudy again and sometimes when I do that I then get algae growing again but um, it co goes back to what I was saying earlier it's a patience thing because it will settle down in time but yeah take it out because then you're removing nutrients from the pond um, if you remove it. I usually stick it on the side of the pond for a little bit just in case there are any creepy crawlies in there that want to crawl back in. Give them a chance before I put it straight on the compost heap. I, as for how, how deep a pond should be, I mean in terms of a pond the best advice is the bigger you can make it the better but you obviously have to decide how much of your garden you want to give over to a pond um, and the, again, to some extent, the deeper, the better, in that it depends, the deeper it is, you'll get different things. If it's very shallow, frogs will breed, almost, like I say, in a bucket or a bowl of water almost. Uh, great crested newts need very deep water, more than 60 centimetres. Um, I mean, one thing about ponds is don't put fish in, because that will kind of, uh, not only do they eat a lot of the things you would want to have in your pond from a wildlife point of view, but they also stir up the mud. 
and they also urinate into the water, which all increase the nutrients and will guarantee cloudy water and lots of algae. So no fish, uh, but really it's a matter of what you want to grow and um, how deep you are prepared to go. Mine's about a metre deep at its deepest point. Um, for a pond that size, that was about sensible, but it has shallows. And having a, sh a shallow shelf, you know, if you've got hedgehogs, make sure they've got somewhere they can climb out, otherwise they will drown. Does that help, I hope? Yeah, thank you. I suppose I'd, I also want to say to people with small gardens like myself, don't be, you know, we, lo we look at your pond and think, oh my goodness, I could never do that. But, you know, just sink a container into the lawn yeah. or into your flower bed or into your garden. And if you get some plants in it, it's going to be beneficial for wildlife. Don't don't be put off by thinking it's it's got to be a metre deep. It's got to have all these contours, any sort of container, especially if you, you know, you make some shallows in it so that uh, creatures can drink in it and, and you've got some plants in it. You know, it's, it's just going to be beneficial, isn't it, Steve? I think that's, that's it is. the I mean, the, in the hot, dry weather in the summer, our pond is a place where all the birds come because they're thirsty and it's it's an easy drink. Um, I mean, the uh, the blackbirds are very territorial when they're breeding, so we get quite a few arguments going on over whose who's territory the pond is in. It's usually sitting at the edge of two or three territories. Um, one of our blackbirds has taken a liking to tadpoles. When we have small tadpoles, it's learned that it sits at the edge and grabs tadpoles out. But we've got thousands of tadpoles, so it doesn't, doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a knock-on effect. We still get plenty of frogs in the garden. I mean, when the frogs hatch, the gardening's crawling with frogs, and frogs eat small slugs and pests. So, you know, it all, it all builds up. The more of this you have, the better it gets. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Then, um, Alistair's asked a couple of questions, Jenny. He's been asking about um, what's stopping retailers from selling and using peat-free products. And he's also asked about where's the best place to buy things like bird boxes and bug hotels and feeders and things like that. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on what's stopping uh, retailers, Jenny? Um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a tricky one, really. Um, there was actually a government sort of pledge uh, back in 2010 that uh, the UK was going to phase out the use of peat, um, well, in domestic gardens by 2010 and with commercial horticulture by 2020. But obviously, we're in 2021 now and that's not happened. Um, there are issues with the fact that basically destroying a peatland and digging it up is cheap, um, which <laughs> it sounds like it shouldn't be, but basically it is. Um, and so creating kind of compost from that, uh, that way, you know, it's a cheap way of doing it. At the end of the day, these companies are out to make money, not save the world. Um, there's also, you know, there are issues with resistance to change. The reason that peat was, was used in horticulture in the first place is because it retains water well and basically it's nutrient free. So the kind of compost companies can add their own mixes and their own nutrients and things to it. And there is just a bit of resistance to change. Um, like, well, we've always used peat, it's cheap, it's easy. So let's just carry on using it. Um, I did notice there was another question just asking about where peat free comes from and are there any issues there? And basically there are lots of different peat free composts out there and they're made up of lots of different things. Um, there's brands that are based on things like composted sheep's wool and bracken and there are brands that use things like you know, composted wood chippings and things like that. Um, another ingredient you sometimes find in peat-free composts is coir, which is basically the hairy bits on the outside of coconuts. Now, this is a waste product um, and basically coir is nutrient-free and really good at retaining water. So can 
be seen as a really good substitute for peat and it is definitely a waste product. Now there are potentially some concerns around the fact that, you know, it's not grown in the UK. Unfortunately, our climate does not support coconuts, which is a shame, but, um, you know, so obviously this has to be shipped a long way across the world. Um, there are potential issues around, you know, exactly how sustainable a lot of the coconut plantations are. To be honest, this is something that it's something that everyone needs to make up their own minds on. Um, certainly not using peat and destroying peatlands. Anything has got to be better than that. Um, so yeah, I think kind of going back to, to the original question, sorry, Hilary, I digressed a bit there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's just issues with people not wanting to change. And when it comes to a lot of the plants that are grown in peat, a lot of it comes from tiny plug plants that uh, garden centres actually grow in, uh, buy in, sorry. And they've been grown quite often abroad by some, you know, some really huge kind of um, horticultural growers, these really, really massive companies. And they still grow in peat because of this resistance to change. But it means that unless um, some of your garden centres and your nurseries are growing from seed, they very often buy in these plug plants and then grow those on, they're already in peat. And so it's very difficult to kind of get your peat free. And that's where supporting the smaller and the more independent nurseries can really make a big difference. I hope that sort of answered yeah. the question. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you very much. And um, we've got time for some more questions. So I'm, I'm going to go to you, Steve. We've had a couple of pest questions. Yes. So somebody's worried about gooseberry sawfly, and That's somebody else one. put in the chat that uh, aphids were destroying a honeysuckle. Yeah. Um, now I, I remember being sent out by my mother with a water pistol to shoot uh, black fly off black be <laughs> <laughs> off the broad beans. And I don't know whether that was to actually get rid of the black fly or whether it was to just get rid of me out of the house. I don't know. What, what, do, you, what do you think, Steve? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'll take the gooseberry sawfly one first because I grow gooseberries and um, they didn't discover them for a couple of years and then they did and we got lots of they were eating all loads of the leaves off and yes if you don't do anything you can they can strip your bushes all together what i do now is about this time of year in the next few weeks keep looking at your gooseberry bushes with the fresh green leaves the gooseberry sawflies lay their eggs in little batches and you'll find that you'll start to spot one or two leaves as they get bigger with little holes all over them and if you look at them closely there are these tiny green larvae eating these holes and at that stage they're all in one place on one leaf so if you keep checking your bush for the next few weeks and then I mean I just pull these leaves off with all the caterpillars on and I squash them and if you just put a bit of effort in at this time of year you can get nearly all of them because they start off on one leaf as a little batch and they're really obvious because they eat all these little holes like a little net so have a go at that. I mean, um, I don't, you know, I don't want to put use pesticides at all. So I was in a bit of a quandary with that one, but then I spotted them. Uh, and yeah, there is a, they're at risk when I see them now. <laughs> right. um, aphids. Yeah. I mean, aphids are, are a problem. I'm on, there are, um, like I, I think I said before, there are some products that are licensed for use on organic crops. And if you need to use, if you are going to buy something to spray, then, I mean, the thing, if you're an organic grower, it doesn't mean to say you use no chemicals at all, but there's, there's like a list of chemicals that you're allowed to use, and it's quite a small list. Um, some of them are actual pesticides, like permethrin, I think, uh, pyrethroids rather, which is, uh, I still prefer not to use. But there are some um, sprays that have kind of a, an oil in them. It's like a soapy oil, and you just spray them with that. Now, you can do it yourself by just... Um, a bit of washing up liquid and a, and a water pistol, as you said, you know, um, it doesn't kill the aphids, but it, it knocks them off. I mean, and I would suggest that for honeysuckle. Um, I'm su I'm su um, I suspect that there's too many to actually squash them by hand. 
Um, but with some plants, I mean, I mentioned broad beans earlier on. I grow mine quite early because the aphids get worse in the summer. Um, they always get the black aphids on them and um, they're always on the shoots. So I start off by nipping off the shoots as soon as I spot them and squash all the aphids. Um, there are parasitic wasps that lay eggs in aphids. And for some types of aphids, you can actually buy um, biological control or, uh, things. They're not cheap. I've never tried them, so I don't know how effective they are. But on my broad beans, I grow them early in the season nip all the aphids off as they come. It keeps them under control. And then by the time the aphids start to get bad, I've usually had enough bean, you know, the beans are finished really. So it depends on the, the plants. I mean, they're, they're a fascinating thing in that, I mean, broad beans, it, it's quite amazing how plants protect themselves. Broad beans, when they get attacked by aphids, actually produce a chemical that attracts the parasitic wasps to come and attack the aphids. That's clever. I mean, it's even more clever in that there are fungi that live in the soil that, the, that enable the plants to communicate with each other. So if one gets attacked, it can communicate with other broad beans and tells them it's happening. Unfortunately, it doesn't really happen fast enough and effective enough to, to kill all the aphids on my broad beans, so I have to take some action. Um, but yeah, there are some, some ways of doing that. I mean, I, I never use a chemical. I, I mean, I'm, maybe not everybody's like me, but I'd rather lose a crop one year than have a crop that is contaminated with chemicals, I'm afraid. Not everybody would maybe agree with me on that, but that's the way I am, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's one of the things, isn't it? To, uh, it's like you said before about being patient, but also um, taking a lot of notice. Like you say, you've got to go out and look at your crops and your fruit bushes and, and take real notice of what's going on. So that's all, all part of of being an organic grower is is understanding how things are growing and what's doing well and what isn't and and then spotting all these pests at an early stage when we can actually do something about them so yeah that's really useful thanks um jane has asked about a chamomile lawn and is it going to attract wildlife um non-flowering chamomile recommended she says she wants a small area of green but not turf I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Steve. Well, yes. I mean, if it's not flowering, there's a, a lot of pollinating insects aren't going to benefit from it, obviously. Um, but the, the thing about any, I mean, a lot of people do want a lawn. And if you do have a lawn, again, avoid spraying it with loads of herbicides and chemicals to you know have a lawn with a few weeds in have a lawn that isn't absolutely perfect like a bowling if you want if you have a bowling green then maybe you need to do that but if you haven't got a bowling green in your garden then you know allow a few things to grow there and the, the other thing to remember with the chamomile lawn is the stuff on top is only a part of it because the soil is full of invertebrates as well and um, if you've got a healthy lawn that you haven't put chemicals on and so on, there will, although you maybe only see non-flowering chamomile on top, underneath there will be all sorts of tiny insects, worms and other things. So, and in fact, if you watch things like starlings walking about in your garden, starlings hunt for things in the soil and you'll see them probing into the soil on lawns and they'll do the same on a chamomile lawn. And they're looking for grubs and larvae and insects that are living in the soil. So just because it, with a non-flowering chamomile, it might look pretty dead on top. Um, I think underneath it will do very well as long as you keep the chemicals off. Uh, there are a couple of, there are a few insects that eat chamomile, but they're mostly quite rare, unfortunately. So I don't think, uh, don't think you'll get those, but then that might be good for you. <laughs> I don't know. Right, okay. Can I just jump in there? Sorry to interrupt. Mm. I'm, I'm actually in the process of creating a garden um, at my house here. The, currently the back garden is completely made out of tarmac, which is not ideal. Um, but we're gonna have a, an area of kind of lawn, but um, we've gone for species rich turf. So basically my mum is calling this uh, little turf with the weeds already in it. Um, but I think that's great. Mm. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's going to come just like normal lawn, but it's already full of 
clover and knatweed and lots of other lovely native plants that some will flower and, and some will just be kind of slow growing grasses, say, um, obviously it's not down yet. I don't know what it's going to look like, but that might be might be an option. I'm certainly very excited about getting it down and then standing in the middle of it with my mum going, look, mum, it's lovely. Sounds great, Jenny. Sounds Whatever great. Whatever you do, don't get plastic grass. I cringe when I see plastic grass. Although I did see a plastic grass lawn the other day that was full of dandelions growing in, which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> Great, great. So have, have we got time for another question, Ellie? Or are we, are we, I think we've got time for one more, haven't we? One, so, one more. Okay, well, Ke Kenneth is, is having trouble composting. He says his compost is taking ages. Uh, have you got any ideas of what, what could help his, his composting along, Steve? Oh, God. for years I failed at compost. I really did. I used to buy the plastic bins when I had, because before I moved here, I had quite a small garden and I used to buy plastic and I, it never worked well. And I had wormeries, which worked a bit better. Um, it is, it is difficult. Um, I mean, the, when they tell you that the compost heap gets really hot and generates its own heat, they're talking about much bigger compost heaps than we can do in our gardens. And I've never managed, I think I once got a compost heap in this garden that was getting a bit warm but it, it doesn't get like that, um, which means it doesn't kill the weed seeds, which means that I don't put the weed seeds in there. You know, I only put in, you know, I, I'll put those in my um, council recycling bin where it will get properly composted in something much more serious than I've got. Um, but it needs to be kept wet. It needs to be turned over quite regularly because it needs air in there. Um, a friend of mine puts corrugated cardboard in there, in amongst the compost to let the air flow into it, which um, I've never tried myself, but he, he recommended that. Um, yeah, I used to add the compost chemical, but it didn't really seem to do much either. I agree. Um, it's one thing that does make a difference is the stuff being more chopped up. Again, another friend recommended because um, we've got quite a big garden, I recommended um, a shredder because we have a lot of woody stuff and that would never rot at all. And it just gets shoved through this shredder now, which doesn't take very long. And then it gets put in the compost heap and it rots a lot faster. So the more finely chopped stuff is when it goes on, then the better. Also, grass cuttings are great, but if you put them on in one great chunk, they just sit there in a big soggy wet mass. So you need to really mix them up with everything else. And if your compost heap has settled down, I'm amazed by our compost heap. You pile it up high, a couple of days later, it's dropped down again. And you just keep chucking stuff on it and it just seems to keep disappearing. But eventually it settles into a, a heavy mass and you do need to turn it over to get the air back in it again. So there's a few tips there, but yeah, it's, uh, in recent years, I think I've cracked it, uh, <laughs> but it took a long time. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think uh, it's a lot of turning turning it over and adding different sorts of waste, isn't it? Adding twigs and weeds and food waste, you know, vegetable waste, in you know, all all in small bits, so it gets mixed up. That's that's what I do anyway. Um, and be like I say, be patient because the th the day you first go to your compost heap and turn it over and it's worked and it's all wonderful, just like it is on the television programs, you don't don't half feel good. It was brilliant. I almost felt like I wanted to go and tell somebody, you know, it was that, it was that great. I'm a bit sad, really. I should get out more, I know. But anyway. <laughs> great, great. Well, well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yeah, big thank you, everyone. I think uh, it was just a really fascinating talk. I think everyone really enjoyed it. I'm going to speak on everyone's behalf. We all really enjoyed it. So a huge thank you to, to Steve and Jenny and to Hilary for hosting that Q&A um, session. Uh, so yeah, this is all part of My Wild Garden Week, of which there are still four more glorious days of wildlife gardening tips being shared all across our social media. Uh, you can join Russell live in his garden tomorrow where, where he'll be talking a little bit more about uh, going chemical free. And you can also download your free My Wild Garden guide 
from our website. So that's www.lankstwt.org.uk. Um, so thank you all so, so much and have a lovely evening. Bye. Bye. Thank you.